So hello everybody and welcome to Pierce College's Professional Development Week. My name is Leslie Ballway. I'm the director for Pierce College's Center for Career and Professional Development and welcome to Pierce College's Women in Leadership 2021. Women in Leadership at Pierce College has a long and storied history. This is actually our 10th time doing this panel. It gets better with every year. Uh, it's a part this year of our Professional Development Week, which is a series of sessions all devoted towards the theme of resilience and reinvention. This panel will also address those themes specifically through the lens of nevertheless, she persisted. A hearty thank you to those of us who helped orchestrate this, especially major props to Dr. Rita Tolliver Roberts, Brad Hodge, Carleen Sloan, and Marcy Brown. Thank you to the panelists for taking time out of your very busy schedules to share your wisdom and your stories with us. And lastly, thank all of you for attending tonight's panel. A couple of uh, things to talk about before we get started with our questions. First, feel free to turn your cameras on or off depending on your comfort level. Um, doesn't matter to me, whatever is more best for you. And make use of the reactions in the chat throughout the conversation. Chat throughout the the conversation. Um, we will go ahead and allow our panelists to speak and answer a couple questions and then allow you the opportunity to ask them questions at the end. And additionally, keep an eye on that chat because at the end, we're going to put a link into our feedback survey. Not only do we want your feedback from this event, but we also want you to enter our raffles. We have two raffles, one to win one of three $100 gift cards and one, I'm excited to say we are raffling off two copies of a book published by one of our panelists, Serena Moore Thomas, called Water Walker, How to Embrace Uncertainty and Do What Seems Impossible. Um, so make sure that you, you fill that survey in. Um, if you would like to do two uh, submissions so you can remain anonymous, do one with your feedback and one with your name to enter in the raffle, that's totally fine. Okay, so now that the housekeeping is out of the way, let's go to our panelists. Tonight, we are here joined by Jennifer Carter Lawyer, Assistant Vice President, Corporate Human Resources at TD Bank. Melissa Fox, Chief Operating Officer, Ascenda Integrated Health. Serena Moore Thomas, CEO and founder of the Highmark Group, LLC. Grace Castro, Senior National Account Manager, Granger, and Dawn Bruno, Pierce alumna and VP of HR, McCormick and Taylor. Panelists, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thanks for, for having, having us. us. For having us. <laughs> thank you. So the, the theme to this year is, this year's Women in Leadership is nevertheless, she persisted. So panelists, can you please introduce yourselves and tell us about a time when life knocked you down and how you got back up again? Uh, let's begin with uh, Jennifer. Well, uh, good evening to everyone and to um, the distinguished panelists, as well as all the students and faculty. Thank you, Piers, for having me here. Um, so a time that um, I've worked for TD Bank, just to kind of introduce myself, I've been at TD Bank for the past eight and a half years. I've worked in the human resources field uh, for the past 23 years. Uh, so your question, Leslie, um, is in regards to a time that um, I've been knocked down. It, it, when I think about that, you know, it's, I go back to the very beginning um, when I was in college and I was doing internships and things of that nature. So I kind of brought myself back to that space a bit because I've had some tenure in the HR role. And from a personal and career perspective, um, looking at my journey and what I've been through, um, for me, the first experience that I can remember as, as a female, as an African-American female, um, was a gender bias that actually happened to me um, that took place at the first company that I interned at. And, and when I think about it, it's interesting because the, at the time I was in graduate school and I was at Rowan and I was in the grad program. And during the summers, um, I was actually um, going to this particular company and working as a graduate student as an, an, as an intern, paid internship, which was great at the time. So um, in that, I had the opportunity to really work side by side with different um, folks and partner 
in fields of public affairs. I was working in that department. I worked in shadow with folks in HR. So I was really kind of getting my feet wet and kind of learning and navigating my way. So, you know, I, I had the educational stuff behind me. And then of course, naturally we as folks coming out of college, you wanna start getting the work experience at hand, right? So I, you know, I was in my first summer of that internship and at the end, naturally I was starting to meet with folks and this particular individual I asked to meet with was a gentleman who was in HR and um, he was an executive level person. So I asked to meet with him and definitely had an opportunity to um, connect with him and say, hey, you know, I really wanna pick your brain. What can I do to get my feet wet? And that's all of us, right? Naturally, we wanna speak to folks and get their feedback. And how did you, you know, navigate this? And what did you do in order to get the experience? I'm looking for the same. So um, in the conversation, the gentleman proceeded to tell me, he said, well, um, nothing. And I was kind of like, okay, nothing as in do the internship and that's it. No, no other advice, anything in that nature. And he said, no, um, nothing more that you can do. Aren't you about to be engaged? Aren't you engaged? Aren't you about to get married? And I said, well, yes. Yeah. I just gotten engaged. And he said, okay, well, you know, really for you, all I foresee is you actually being home married and, and taking care of kids. That was what he told me. <laughs> and so as I'm sure you all, I was taken aback <laughs> by his response to me. And um, you know, this is someone in a leadership role. This is someone that I was looking to get feedback in terms of the experience that I could you know, navigate through. And he looked at me and pretty much saw you know, from a female perspective, well, you're a female. And this was 20 years ago, of course. So, you know, things have changed since then. And we have processes and things in place in HR now for something of that type of uh, discussion or conversation. But, um, you know, he immediately put me in that place to say that, you know, I was only good enough for that role. So, you know, needless to say, I, um, that company asked me to come back and work for them the, the second summer um and which was great i was like you know look i'm gonna get the work experience i'm gonna you know this is a great company overall so i wouldn't take that away from that particular experience but after i completed that summer intern they had offered me to start working for them and this was in north jersey at the time and so i said you know that i was offered an opportunity to work in their human resources department underneath this person <laughs> so um, for me, um, at the time, I turned the opportunity down and took another opportunity out here in Philadelphia, um, working for Comcast, actually. And um, I ran into this person and he saw me in passing and said, hey, you know, I didn't expect you to be back here. I said, yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and um, pretty much uh, he said, well, you know, there was an opportunity to open up in our department. And I said, yeah, have you thought about it? And I said, yeah, I did. And um, for me, unfortunately, and you never burn bridges with folks, you turn it into a learning opportunity for yourself. And um, in that moment, I had the opportunity to tell him, I turned it down. I actually went with another company, um, relocation purposes and reasons. And the most attractive part of it for me was that I'd be working in a human resource de department with a lot of women who are in high level roles, you know, that were vice presidents and definitely knew I was going to be able to learn from that. And so it was diversified for me. So, and I told him, well, you know, I'm going to go somewhere where there's going to be a lot of women leadership there. So I prefer going there. So you should have saw his face. You should have saw my exit interview. <laughs> um, but that personally was something for me to connect um, at a younger age in terms of, wow, you all are going to have to face that, that was my first experience, you know, knowing that I'm probably gonna come across more of this in, in my life and certainly have. Um, so it's definitely a personal battle that I looked at, but now I look back at it and say, I'm glad that happened to me because you never allow people to put you in that box and define what you're capable, capable of. So I would say that would be my, my experience. Thank you so much for sharing that. Serena, yeah. can you answer that question? 
I sure can. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, everyone. I'm Serena Moore Thomas. Um, my story is, is pretty, um, has been uh, filled with uh, ups and downs and uh, a story of just persistent, consistent effort. Uh, I started out as a teenage mother. I had twins when I was 17 years old. Um, I, I was the young person as a younger teenager. I was the one who, you know, before all of my friends, I was driving and funding my own bank account and getting a job and doing all the things. I had dreams of going to Hillman College um, where I was going to be on the drill team. And if anybody, if that's from a different world, y'all, you just got to know that. Um, but anyhow, I had dreams <laughs> of going to college and doing all these things. Uh, and, and I got into a, uh, what I would call a situation because when you're 17 and um, the person you're with is 10 years older than you, that's a situation, that's not a relationship. Um, and I know that now. And, and so I had twins at 17, my last year of high school. Uh, I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. I basically, like I've always wanted to own my own business ever since I can remember. Um, I had two goals in my whole life as a teenager. And that was, I wanted to be on the cover of Black Enterprise Magazine. And I wanted to make six figures by 30. Those were like it. Those were my two goals, right? I had no idea um, about entrepreneurship at all. So I was not the girl who knew how to make baskets, who did hair, who sold platter. Like I didn't have anything that I equated with entrepreneurship. I just knew I was, I needed to be the boss, right? I just knew I had too much talent to sit behind a desk and do the same thing every day. That's all I knew, right? So I wanted to be an entrepreneur. Fast forward that summer um, after I graduated from high school with my twins in my arms, um, it was very clear that I needed to um, do something different than what my friends were doing. And so while they were preparing to go on to college and going on to have a um, incredibly awesome summer, I was preparing for single parenthood and taking care of two babies. And I ended up getting a job with my father on a construction site. I worked in the trailer. He worked in the field. While we worked at this construction site together, I found out that my father, well, my father found out that there was a contractor there um, who won a six-figure contract to do uh, cleaning, construction site cleaning. And my father came to me at that time and was like, Serena, if you could figure out how to start a business, I'll do the service and we'll have our own business. And I said, okay, you know, sound good to me. I'm just a little miss entrepreneur anyway, I'll try it. And understand these were the days of like AOL dial up. And that sounds like a long time ago. That wasn't that long ago, yo. Um, so I had AOL dial up. What is a business? What is an S corp? What is a C corp? What is an EIN? What is a DUNS number? I knew nothing. I didn't have a college degree. I didn't have anything but a whole lot of faith and these two babies, that's all. Right. So this is what I'm working with. And this idea. Um, well, long story short, we ended up starting Elohim Cleaning Contractors. And, and, and I'll just put a paper clip there real quick. In between that time, I needed to work. I needed to fund, you know, a, a life. Um, I moved out of my parents' house at 18 and I lived on my own. Um, so me and two babies as a teenager. Um, in an apartment. And there were days where I cried, they cried, we all cried. Um, there were days where I would look out the window and be like, okay, what kind of life do I want to provide for these babies? And those were the things that kind of, you know, were, were driving me. And so we did go on to, to start Elohim Cleaning Contractors. We started that business and funded our first employee with my father's unemployment check. That business grew out of my brother's bedroom from nothing to well over a couple million dollars in sales in six years. I was CEO of the company for 11 years. I had no idea what I was doing. I had no idea that most companies don't even reach a million dollars. I had no idea about the, the failure rate of small businesses. I was focused on absolutely no one else. And I think my blissful ignorance was my best blessing because I was not trying to compare myself to another human being on the earth. Um, that business allowed me to fulfill those two childhood dreams. I was on the cover of Black Enterprise in uh, January 2009. Um, and I you know, was able to make six figures by 30. That was my other one. Um, and I went on to run other companies. And so, so far at this time, 
Um, my father and my brother still run that company that we started. My twins are 22. <laughs> um, they are 22 years old. One is graduating college this year. Um, and one of my one of my twins just had a baby that is nine months old. So I'm somebody's meaning. You see her, I'm somebody's grandmama. <laughs> So um, the twins are doing well. I ended up getting married. I mean, so I ended up getting married to, to the man of my dreams, not the man of my teens. Thank you, Lord. Um, and I have two more children. They are seven and nine years old. We homeschooled them. We have several businesses now. And um, again, my story has been one of um, persistent, consistent ever. You can cry, but don't you dare quit. That has been my testimony. That's what I'm, that's my story. I'm sticking to it. Um, and it's not always easy, but it's worth it. So I'll yield the floor to the next panelist. That's it. <laughs> that's that's it. She says, <laughs> "Wow, that's that's so much. That's that's incredible." Um, you know, I love that you you decided early on and you stuck to that. That's amazing. Um, Melissa, could you answer that question? So, Leslie, my biggest fear was that you were going to put me next after Serena. <laughs> I should have given you like, all a pass stick. <laughs> you know just let her go to Grace first. <laughs> Look, let me tell you, you got me in here shouting and, and, you know, I am just so in awe of both of the testimonies that we just heard in terms of the strength and the power of perseverance and just believing in yourself. So, so kudos. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to try to Try to not, not match that because that's not what we're doing. We're not competing. This is all about uplifting each other. But try not to bore y'all after y'all heard that. So, <laughs> so thank you very much, sister, for that powerful, powerful testimony. So my name is Melissa Fox, as you know. Um, and I've been in healthcare operations and administration for a little over 20 years now. And actually, it looks like it's a little bit longer at this point. Um, very proud to do that. And, and what has driven me to be involved in what I do and providing care for the communities and making communities better tracks all the way back to my childhood, right? So it tracks all the way back to seeing what happens when systems don't work and when systems fall apart and people get hurt when the proper connections are not in place. So seeing all of that, you know, seeing what, you know, murders in the family, seeing substance use disorder, seeing that mental health, mental illness, seeing all of that and knowing that there had to be a better way. So, you know, when I started off in my career, I had a fire. And a lot of you on this phone, on this call tonight, probably have that fire as well. You like, you know, I'm going out, I'm making a change. So my, one of my first jobs, I hit the ground running. I wanted to be involved in everything. I wanted to be sitting at the table and have a voice and support everybody I could support. Like Jennifer, I wanted to make the right connections and really being as involved as I could. Now I had a supervisor now, remember, I was very, very young at this point, um, had a supervisor, a white woman, very nice. She's a nice lady, you know, went over to our house. Um, aside from the fact that, she, you know, she had her cats walking around the dishes, um, she uh, didn't go back over for dinner. That was a whole different, that's a whole different story for a different webinar. Um, <laughs> but, but other than that, you know, very, very nice lady. And I thought we got along really, really well. So one day she brought me in from one of my first um, performance evals. And so this is where you get to hear all the great things in this, my mind, all the great work you've been doing. You know, remember I'm on fire at this point, you know, at this point, I'm just, the world is ahead of me and I'm ready to make a, be a part of it and make a change. And I'm proud of the work that I've been doing. And so one of the first things she said to me in that meeting was you need to be less aggressive. And I remember that feeling like it was yesterday. All of the wind went out of me. And I know in that moment, you know, I would re I recall some of our interactions where she would, I would be sitting in meetings with her and she would say, you know, try not to, to talk so much. Or, you know, you might be, you're, you're kind of coming across as too um, overbearing is what she said. So all the words, and, and I know a lot of the, the women and the black women on this line have heard those words before. And at that time, I didn't realize what she was saying and what she meant, but I really took it to heart. She told me, you know, if you learn how to do this, you will not go far, is what she said. Those were her exact words. You will not go far if you don't learn how to pull your personality in and how to not be as aggressive and overbearing as you are. That can scare people. 
And that was the exact word that she used that I could scare people. And I, I sat and I thought on that and I took that so much to heart, all y'all, that I changed, I started from that day for a while to change who I was. And I started to try to seem not as threatening. I tra started to change my whole personality. And there are a few of you on the line who know me and I like to talk and I like to laugh and I like to just be who I am. But at that point, I felt like I needed to smile less. I needed to not be as assertive about what I, what I believed were my rights or what I believed was right for the people we were helping. I didn't want to scare, sorry. I didn't want to scare the people around me. And I actually needed to make her feel more comfortable around me. And so I changed with a central self of who I was. And that went on for many years where I learned essentially how to not be me. So it took a while longer for me to start to realize, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. That was her problem. That was not my problem. That was her insecurity to bear, not mine. She should have been the one learning how to grow and how to deal with other personalities and how to deal with someone like me and help to strengthen me and use my talents and skills to grow and grow the department and to grow the company. But she didn't do that. She shied away from that. So what I would say is, you know, to all of you on the line, you know, you don't let anyone define you. Use your passion, use your unique talents, your unique voice to build yourself up and to build up the people around you. Use, feel okay with using your talents, whatever they may be, to now move yourself forward move your excellence forward, let your light shine. The sister Serena just sat here and talked about how she didn't even have a roadmap. She made her way, she made her path. And she could not have done that had she not tapped into her essential self. So it took me many years to get back to that. And so if I was to say, you know, how you, one, one of the ways that, you know, I got kind of knocked down and I don't see it as that because I don't think that, you know, she did set me back a bit, but I came back. Um, that was one of the things that affected me for so long that it took me to grow out of it and to be okay again with myself as a leader and as a professional. Wow, and I, I can believe that you took that and, and passed that on with the people that you began to raise up and let them know that they needed to light their passion and be who they are. I love that. Thank you so much for, for sharing that, Melissa. Here's one. Uh, and then you put the one down and you grab the other one. Um, Dawn, can you tell us about a time that, that life kind of knocked you down and how you got back up? Sure. Wow. What an amazing group of women. And your stories are just so um, empowering and really, really amazing. Um, so my situation was a little bit different. I, um, I first attended Pearson in 1990, thinking that I wanted to become a paralegal. And I um, instead decided that I wanted to get married and buy a house. And I was 19 years old and um, I left school and I went to work for a company as an administrative assistant. Um, I reported to the president of the company and throughout my time there, I realized that we didn't have an HR department. And I kind of worked backwards. I went back to school, got my certifications, and I created this HR department. I've been with my company 28 years, and I was um, in an official HR role beginning about 2005. Um, and I pretty much worked independently. I reported directly to the president of the company, um, and that was that. And then I'd say in about 20, 2011, um, we had new owners who were also employees of the company. They, they bought the company. Um, and we were going through a structural change um, all the way up until about 20, 2018. So um, at that time, I was already the vice president of human resources. And I had um, taken a medical leave. My, my husband had gone through a stem cell transplant. And when I came back in early um, 2019, I had learned that my department had a new reporting structure. I had a new boss. I had new accountabilities. So 
with all of my HR knowledge aside, I was basically being asked to hit my reset button and how I operated and to forget everything I knew about how I operated. So, you know, I, I went through a lot of the um, normal emotions. I felt hurt. I felt betrayed. I was confused. You know, I, I was officially in a rut. Um, I had virtually no HR network. I realized that my experiences and my self-value were um, heavily reliant on, on the company that I grew up in. And, um, you know, after going through the emotions, my best friend, she pulled me aside and she said, listen, you have got to find your agency. And, you know, she, she was right. I had to get it together. I, I had to learn how to make decisions without that emotional attachment that I was so feeling, you know, do I want to leave this company that I love and I've been with for 20, you know, 26 years at that point, do I stay, you know, what do I do? And I went back to something my mother always used to say to me, you know, never do anything when you're in doubt, never walk away from a situation until you're 100% sure that that is what you want to do. So I gave myself a timeout during my reset phase. I, I didn't um, react and, and leave the company like I, I wanted to. I took some time and I decided that, you know, what is going to help me find my agency? What is going to help me feel empowered again? Okay, I'm going to get my finances in order. <laughs> you know, I'm going to work on that. I'm going to work on the relationship with my new boss and see what happens. I'm going to give it a shot. I'm going to get involved with my HR community. I began to get involved with SHRM. I needed to create a network. I had to go outside of my comfort zone. You know, when you spend that much time at the same company and then you suddenly find yourself in a situation like that, you know, I had to make some, some quick decisions and not just feel sorry for myself. So, you know, I was, I was learning, I was stretching, I had to be vulnerable. I began to join committees, I got involved. And what do you know, you join a committee, then you're being recommended for the board. I reached out to peers, alumni. I said, let me get involved here. Um, you know, and, and then COVID happens. So now I lost my staff. So now I'm, I'm starting to make progress on some ends, but now I have no staff. And you know, when you, when you have a department or you have a staff, you know, while you may have your finger on the pulse of everything that's going on day to day, you're not necessarily doing those actual tasks things evolve. I'm not a micromanager. For staff that I had with me for eight or 10 years, they knew how to do that job. I had to now go back and learn everything <laughs> and learn everything over again, you know, all the, the little details and minutia. So I'm, you know, I'm grappling with trying to find a way to um, carry myself forward, but then also go back and, and do those things. So the biggest lesson that I've learned, you know, at the end of the day, where I am now, in some way, everything that happened was exactly what I needed to happen. I needed that to happen. I needed to learn how to be vulnerable. I learned it. I needed to learn how to trust again. I needed to learn how to check my ego at the door. And I had to find what was going to help me feel empowered and confident. And, you know, at the end of the day, I didn't want to start over again at a company. It's the same situation. You go into a company, you know, you take your body of knowledge with you. These people would not know me from Adam. I don't work. I work for a good company. I was faced with a situation where I had options. I had to decide which road I was going to take. Um, and, you know, it, it's interesting. I've had some wonderful, amazing experiences in the last two years. Um, and I, I also see that, and I'm, I'm gonna call you out. I see Jackie Linton is on this and Jackie is the president of SHRM. I consider her a mentor. I consider her, you know, she took a chance with me and she pushes me and she encourages me. And that's what you need. You know, that's the kind of people that you need in your life. And, um, Yes, yeah, so Jackie helped me find my agency as well.
<laughs> that's my I love that story. that story of um you know setting the uh, hitting the reset button without completely throwing everything up in the air I love that you got in touch with yourself thank you very much for sharing that uh so lastly on this this question um can we have Grace chime in about a time that life knocked you down and how you got back up sure well again good evening everybody and thank you so much for having me and Wow, in the company of some amazing women, I so appreciate you all sharing your stories and your, your journeys. Um, and <laughs> the burden's on me to, to, to now be the last one. But um, for me, um, you know, let me, let me just start with a little background about you know, who, who I'm employed with, because that'll set the tone for, for how I kind of got back up. Um, if you're not familiar with Granger, we're a $12 billion broadband, um, broadline business to business distributor of maintenance, repair, and operating supplies. So you might be thinking, what is that? You look around when you go back to your offices and your, your schools, think about all the things that are behind the walls, the plumbing, the electrical, all the things that, that keep your, your buildings operating. Um, and the people that service those, you know, keeping them safe, giving them the things that they need. So that's Granger. We supply all of those products. And the industry is the um, maintenance, repair, and operations industry. So I say all that to say that, you know, I have been with Granger for four years. Prior to that, I had uh, a near 17 year career in the media and marketing world. So big transition in terms of industry and taking the, the leap to kind of move into a new industry. So the piece that kind of, you know, if you'd say knock me down and I, I got back up was, you know, not letting fear take away an opportunity to try something new. Um, be open to new opportunities, especially when you have skills that are translate, transferable. Sales and marketing are transferable skills. And I was able to apply those to a new industry. And, and, you know, let me be clear, it was hard. Don't get me wrong. It was stressful. Um, you know, the, the term drinking from a fire hose had new meaning for me, jumping into an industry that I did not know the language, the jargon, the, um, you know, how their go-to-market strategy, all that stuff I had to learn. That's completely different from what I was selling with media marketing. And I was, uh, I'm, I was clapping, Serena, when you were talking about Black Enterprise, because that's my former employer. And, and that's where I would say I kind of grew up in, in media and marketing. Uh, and it was a great experience. Um, but I wanted to do something on a grander, on a more enterprise level and take what I've learned, you know, with, with my uh, experience and apply that. And, you know, four years in doing well, but I will say it took work. It's, you know, you have to invest in yourself and your own success. You have to find peers and mentors that will help you. Thankfully, I was able to do that. Um, I read everything I could. Um, I think uh, like somebody else said, you know, you, Dawn, I think you said it, you know, I got involved in trades and just really engulfed myself in it. And at the end of the day, you know, I'm enjoying what I'm doing. What I'm doing is a little, it, I'm selling something different, but, you know, at the end of the day, I get to help my customers uh, solve problems. I'm creative at heart. So I come up with all kinds of things to help them. And I love that part of my job. So that's the part of my story that, you know, if, if there was a downtime and, and, you know, I had to kind of pick yourself up. I had some dark, dark nights, where I'm like, did I make the wrong decision <laughs> mid-career here? Um, but no, it, it's been, everything happens for a reason. Um, you know, it, it's great when you have a roadmap, but sometimes when you don't, that's okay too. Um, things happen and, and you are in positions for a reason. People are put, you know, in front of you and, and around you in your life for a reason. Leverage them, you know, um, but don't let fear stop you from, you know, taking on something new. Uh, don't let fear stop you from taking on something new. I think that is a, a wonderful uh, way to, to really summarize, I think, everybody's story here. Um, so uh, it, moving on to our next question, in the year 2020, really 
the, the rug was swept from under everyone. Yet as our society screeched to a halt, it seems that women in particular took the brunt of this. We saw women, especially women of color, leave the workforce in droves. An, estimate, an estimated 3 million women left the workforce in response to the pandemic. Now, given that we are, we're, we're talkers, uh, let's hear one thing that we as leaders can do to support women through this. Um, let's start with uh, Jennifer again. We'll just go in the same order. Okay. Um, I think there needs to be a culture of empathy with our women. And what I mean by that is for companies, they really need to delve down, drive down into seeing what the issue is at hand. You said it best, it's, it's most women have left. A lot of them have downsized. Most of the folks that in my cases that I've dealt with um, and many of whom are women have said, listen, I've got to be at home. I've got to take care of my mom, my dad. Um, you've got issues where now COVID hit. I mean, it was huge, I think for everybody here. And we had to rethink and change our way of doing things. So what you can do as a company, whatever company you work for, you know, you need to have a culture of empathy. And as women, we have to be supportive of women. I had so many women reach out to me, whether LinkedIn, whether, you know, hey, Jen, um, I'm going to draw back. I don't want to be in this job anymore because I got to do this over here. I'm handling the household. I'm handling over here. I'm, 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 trying, to, I'm trying to be on all the time. And I think that's, you know, it's, it's unfortunate because we as women, we were caregivers. We always want to, you know, be there for everybody and do for everything. And we have to stop and take a look at ourselves and say, look, I need to invest some time in me. It just is what Grace mentioned. So one of the things that we need to look at is embracing the culture of empathy with our peers, reach out check on them, see how they're doing. If folks have lost jobs, you have a responsibility in a leadership role to reach back and help and pull up. And if someone says, I need to talk to you, can you look over my resume? Can you do this? Can you help? You have a responsibility to do that. And I think that's huge for all of us. Companies have to respond differently now. Um, I know my company has extended leaves of absences They've added on more PTO time. They've given childcare. They've given elder care. They've given bonuses. Um, things that have they that people at least on the front line, you know, engaging customers um, with this whole COVID stuff going on. I think all of us had to uproot ourselves and rethink what we needed to do. So um, for me personally, you know, I use the downfall of this pandemic to help myself up. And in that, you know, you have to, as the ladies have all mentioned, you have to put yourself out there. You have to get involved in terms of being on committees. And, you know, with all that's happened with um, uh, the country with racial discrimination and all this stuff happening to all of us, um, it's hard, especially for women, uh, minority women. We're always um, on the bottom. We're not in those leadership roles. We need more people that look like us to be at the table sitting there. And you know, folks who are in college now, there appears when I, I I'm looking for folks who have that burn in their belly to do that. You know, um, we need representation. Um, it's fallen back. It's taken a while for us as women in the past what five six years or so. Um, we've been getting there, but it's it's not there yet. We still have some more room. It's still male um, white male um, um, dominated. Um, and so we really need to have people that look like us at the table, um, being able to contribute equally across the board. So I would say the culture of empathy um, definitely needs to be um, looked at from a company standpoint. Love that, that's great. Serena, can you give us one thing that we can do? Yeah, um, along the same lines, but just from a different approach, um, I would say, mm -hmm. um, I would say this one, just for perspective purposes, the, the way that I view COVID is like a, a storm, a storm of any kind, right? Um, and I've shared this story before, 
um, when we had, I think it was, it was one of the hurricanes, I forget wh which one it was, but it was when, when I was living in Pennsylvania, I'm, I'm currently in, in Florida now, um, but when I was, I don't remember the name of her, um, but either way, it was a hurricane that had come and everybody was, you know, we were, we were, we were getting in place, ready to be in a blackout and all this stuff, right? Um, during that hurricane, or yeah, in the middle of that hurricane, we um, found out that there was a patch of our roof that was like compromised, right? And it was all this leaking happening and everything happening. Um, and we would not have known it had the storm not come. Um, I look at COVID as the same way. It is an opportunity to see what COVID uncovered. And for many people, COVID uncovered a lot of dysfunction. Um, for some people, COVID set my people free. Um, let my people go, all right? There were some people who realized that they were in a job they hated anyway. Um, and so they left because they were ready to be free, <laughs> right? And so, because um, I, I, I have to speak from, from that perspective because that, that's what I know. Um, and so along those lines, what I would say is we have a responsibility to get vocal. Get vocal about your story, share. The world is craving authenticity, right? We live in a superficial world driven by Facebook and Instagram, y'all, TikTok, you know, nothing is real anymore. It's hard to find a real story. We have, you know, overnight expert successes, <laughs> right? So there's, so those of you that have a story to tell and have a, a, a time of transition or whatever that you can share, um, get more vocal about your story and you don't have to do um, you don't have to, you know, try to heal the world and make it a better place on a grand scale. You do what you can where you are with what you have. And I feel like if we make a commitment to do that, then we are helping our neighbor. We are helping a woman who is struggling. Um, I, I host a podcast called The BMW Life, Boss Mom, Wife Life. Um, at the end of the day, most people struggle, women struggle with identity. Um, and some have found through the workforce that they were defined by their role. And when their role left, they forgot who they were, right? So this is, again, a reason to share, a reason to get vocal about your story, your discovery, and, um, and, and take the initiative to, to reach out to someone who you know um, is in a transition place, right? Um, so that's, that's kind of what, what, what I would say. I hope that, that answers the question. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Melissa, can you give us one thing that we can do to support women in this time? Yeah, I would say um, it's just kind of similar to what Jennifer said and what Serena touched on. Um, each one reach one, you know, to kind of be, make it like wrap it up that it's, it's extremely important to understand and you, you touched on it, that the pandemic did affect women of color, black women in particular, um, significantly harder than it hit everybody else. But prior to the pandemic, there were already significant disparities that were in place from a health perspective, um, from an employment perspective, from an earnings perspective, et cetera. So, so now that's exacerbated it. So what I would say very, you know, very briefly is it, whatever your talents, you know, whatever your resources, if there is a, a woman nearby or even not so nearby who you are able to help, even if it's a little bit, even if it's just to move her a little bit further forward, whatever that may be, making a connection. We all have huge networks, making a connection, of identifying a way where she could have her, her children taken care of while she goes out and looks for a job. You do it yourself. I mean, don't take on more than you could bear, of course, but we have access to resources. And the reason why I'm saying that that's, a so, that's so important is because the, the issue is so big. We want to rely on businesses to do the altruistic thing and do the right thing and, and do what Jennifer spoke about, which is you know give more time off, be more empathetic that's not always gonna be the case. So if that's not the case, then how do we reach our sisters and you know, professional sisters, sisters in the communities who all need some support in moving forward? And the only way to do that in a real sustained way is to make a personal commitment to say yes. that there is an opportunity. And when someone reaches out to me on LinkedIn or Facebook, or if I just hear them talk to somebody else and say, man, life is hard right now. Sister, tell me how it's hard. Woman, tell me how it's hard. You know, neighbor, tell me how it's hard. Tell me what you need and then let me see if there's a way that I can help you. I can't promise that I can do everything for you. And I can't promise that, you know, with maybe with my time commitments, I can't drain because again, self-care is key. But if there's a way that I can make you, get you connected with something that's going to help to make the burden a little bit better, a little bit easier, then it's my job to do that. And that's the part that I think, you know, if we own as professionals, as people, as women, then we will begin to see ourselves move forward because even with the disparities that exist, the systemic disparities that exist, 
if we are advocating for each other in these rooms, if we have a, a, a toehold or you know a foot in the room, then that's going to help someone who's going to come behind us. So that's what I would say. Each one, reach one. Yeah, yeah. really takes that village. Dawn, can you chime in on this? Sure. Um, so I feel that when you have people at work, we we get the whole person, and you know, being in the position of HR. I have the ear of our executive leadership. And one thing that I always push for is to have a platform where employees, where women can share those experiences. I mean, if you have a diversity and inclusion group at work, you can actually have an employee resource group for parents, single parents, women. You know, you can create it the way you want to. It's important that we are kind and we support one another. So many women today knock each other down, whether it's on social, social media or it's in the workplace. That's not helping. That's not helping anyone. You wanna be a mentor. You wanna help break those stigmas. You wanna be supportive. You wanna be empathetic. You wanna promote kindness, not be so judgmental. And you know, when, when I think about what kind of um, things that the company can do, use your social media to promote your diversity and your inclusion. You know, use the tools that you have through your employee resource groups. You know, we have financial um, educational series that we give at work. I added one on divorce. We, you know, give people an opportunity to learn about the do's and don'ts that might be preparing for that. It's not all about engagements, weddings, and births. You know, it's, you, you get the whole person and everything that's going on in their life at that time. And I think if you're in an HR role, you have that opportunity to embrace them. You have that opportunity to give people the help that they need. And um, yeah, that, that's pretty much where I, I stand with that. Awesome, great, great ideas. Grace, can you give us one thing that we can do to support women? Sure, well, I'll, and, and I'll be quick, but it's two that I'll say. Um, the first is uh, very similar to what a lot of you have said is, you know, ask people how they're doing. This is a time where, you know, if anything being in a virtual world and what COVID has taught us is check in on each other, but it's beyond just checking in for work. How are you doing? Ask people on your team or people that you come in contact with and really listen to them give them the, the freedom and the um, ability to share what's going on. Sometimes they just need a sounding board. So, so that's one. And I would say that in light of COVID and a polarized, you know, politically, you know, uh, polarized country and racial injustice and all the other things that are going on that play in the back of everybody's mind, you know, as, as they start and go through their days. The other piece from um, a, leader's pers a leader perspective, and you know, this is where somebody did this for me, I've got to play it forward, but truly be an advocate and an ally for women. And what I mean by that is don't just talk it, don't talk about you know, your network and this, that, and the other, leverage it, use it to help, it's a, it's a, it's a gift. You know, use it to help other people and advance other people. Um, you know, this past summer, we heard a lot of companies come out and talk about their diversity and inclusion and equity. And okay, you can talk about it, but how do you show it? Right. And I look at the advocate the advocate and the ally as being those folks that demonstrate, they, they take action. So what that looks like and what that translates to is, you know, don't host meetings early in the morning or late in the afternoon when you know moms are trying to get their kids ready for virtual learning or help with homework or they're, you know, caring for an ailing spouse or, or um, parent. You know, also, you know, when you hear negative speak in the office or someone's character is being chipped away because, you know, yeah, they do have a child that comes up to them and interrupts during a team's call it happens that it's the world we live in, you know, smile, make them feel comfortable and then play up that person's, um, you know, benefits talk about, you know, how she's a kick butt you know, employee and all the things that she's contributed. She's a mover and a shaker. And why would you not want somebody like that on your team? Really paint the picture of that person, you know, in a different light. So change the, the false narrative. 
Um, and we know bias exists, but for me, I'm committed to helping women to be successful. I've had the bias happen to me. I know how it felt. Thankfully, I had people in my network and around me that helped support me and, and you know, taught me how to advocate for others. So those would be the, the things that I would say is listen, advocate, and be an ally. I love that. I love that idea about amp uh, the amplifying of strengths to uh, overcome other talk. That's amazing. Um, okay, so last question, and I'm going to flip it. I'm going to have, uh, we're going to go backwards this time. So, nevertheless, she persisted. This phrase comes from an interesting moment in recent political history when Senator Elizabeth Warren read aloud a letter written by Coretta Scott King on the Senate floor, even though that was against the rules. The majority leader remarked that despite being warned and explaining the rules, nevertheless, she persisted. Leaders are in a unique position to push against the rules while also needing to enforce them. How do you know when to enforce the rules and what battles do you pick? So let's let's start with Grace this time. Hmm. Um, it really, it's you have to think about the end game. What you know, the phrase you can win the battle but lose the war. What's what's the end game that you want? What's the long-term effect? Is it a short term or long term? You know, evaluate those things. Um, for me, when it comes to things where there's any kind of injustice, whether it's gender or race or what have you, I'm going to speak up. Um, you know, if I'm advocating for myself, especially when it comes for um, Melissa, you talked about it earlier, you know, as women, we, are, you know, we're not on the same playing field when it comes to earnings, I'm going to speak up and I've had former employers tell me, even though I'm doing the job of two men, uh, yeah, you're not going to get paid the same way, or you're not going to have the same title. You know, they're men. I, I actually had someone say that to me. Um, so, you know, that's, that's when you fight, but you do it in a way that is strategic. You demonstrate your worth and the value that you bring to the table and what that's worth if you walk away. Um, and I got the money and the title. Boom. I love that. I, I think I might say that every morning. If, if there's an injustice, I'm going to speak up. That's my affirmation. <laughs> I love it. Um, okay, so Dawn, can you uh, speak to that? Yeah, I'm, I'm still learning how to do that. But I would say that um, what I try and tell myself is don't pick my battle when I'm feeling reactive. Um, I want my battle to be based on facts and not my emotions. I have learned to talk my battle through before I bring it to a head um, with someone that I trust, a mentor. Um, or a friend, you know, a good friend, maybe a colleague. Um, if I decide to pursue that battle, I want to make sure I do it in the most professional, fact-based way I can um, without the emotion. I think that's a, that's a good idea to also build the strength of your, your case. Thank you for sharing that. Melissa, how do, you, how do you know what battles to pick? Well, the first thing, I mean, if you're talking about rules and, and when to, to battle these rules, it's important for, for us all to be clear on what, what, the categories. So there are rules that are that are essentially laws and things like you know HR. They're all holding us accountable to that we should be doing and we should be following. But then there are other, and I think that's what we're talking about: these kind of you know cultural norms or these these work norms that people just tend to accept as what should be the status quo. And so if that is the case, and if that's what you're confronted with, if there's anything that goes against number one, your moral fiber and your morals and what, what you understand to be the right thing. And I know that that's somewhat subjective and this is where Grace's strategic approach comes in. You need to understand if someone is asking you to do something that is against your moral fiber, to do something that's messing with the money, to do something that's moving things around the way that they shouldn't be, treating someone a certain way to try to get them out. That's the kind of stuff that some, some there are some norms within some businesses that are accepted, but that is where you say no. And I, and I have done it in the past as well, where you push back against that. And if it's something that goes against the greater good, and if it goes against the greater goals of what the organization or what you as a team are looking to accomplish, then you should stand up and have a voice. And having a voice, it looks different. And I love that Grace made that point. Depending on the situation, depending on the setting, your having a voice can look very different, but it's important to make sure that everyone involved is clear on where you stand, what your expectations are, and then also what's the plan for us to move forward from this. So I, I think that you know, understanding the difference between those, those kind of norms and what are really the rules that, that need to be followed for legal reasons, um, those are two different things. 
I think that makes a lot of sense um, and, and help getting that clarification, like Don was saying, um, the, the facts. Is it a law or is it a status quo? That's, the gra that's a great uh, foundation to begin that, that question. Uh, Serena, can you give us some insight on this topic? I have nothing to add after Ms. Melissa. <laughs> I, I'm so serious. First of all, y'all, y'all, you just handled it. I mean, I, I, I seriously, I ditto everything you said, everything that has been said um, already. Of course, my, you know, again, my perspective is different because I'm not in a corporate environment um, and I'm not, you know, subject to like a hierarchy or anything like that, right? You know, I'm, I'm just in a different space, but everything um, you said, even the responding, knowing how, knowing the difference between responding versus reacting, because there is a difference, right? You can react and fly off the handle and then, you know, that, that's not a, that, that, that's a reaction um, that, but responding is, is, is a little different because responding is what you do with the end in mind. If I see injustice, I can react, I can, you know, turn a table over, um, but I can also decide how to spend my dollar. That's a response. You know, I can decide what I support and don't support. That's a response. So I, I, that's all I, I have on that. <laughs> oh, I think, you know, reaction versus response is a great way to, to frame that. Um, Jennifer, what, what would you add to that? Uh, I think Serena disclosed it. All of the women pretty much handled it exactly yeah. the way I would say. Um, just to add to it would be more so, let's see, I look at things from a view of HR, just like Dawn. You know, we, we, we deal with day in and day out employees coming to us dealing with conflict resolution constantly. And that's hard, you know, it's an interpersonal skill for all of us that we have to kind of delve into and say, okay, how do I handle this? How do I respond? And, you know, your brand is always being looked at. And particularly when you look at me, you know, you see an African-American woman, right? And so right now with all this going on in the country and all, um, I don't know if any of you saw with The View, um, that happened recently um, with Cheryl and her being careful with not having to respond um, in an angry way um, because that's how we're looked upon, as Melissa mentioned earlier, aggressive. Um, so with that being said, um, we have to be, you know, when you navigate conflict resolution, it's hard and you want to always be true to yourself and be authentic to it. Um, but at the same token, you know, you have to evaluate, and it's a personal decision. You have to also evaluate whether it, you know, it's going to compromise your values. Um, you know, people do crazy things and, you know, you're being watched. And if you're that person who is wanting to look for a job and come work for a company, you know, naturally they interview you, you do great in things. They're going to look at your social media. They're going to look at those things and evaluate to see, you know, hey, is this a responsible individual we want to bring on board? So when you're in these leadership roles, there are responsibilities from that aspect of it. Um, but when I'm when I'm evaluating conflict resolution and how to deal with that, um, I always look at I evaluate the problem. I always look at okay, is this something I should just continue to pursue? Should you know? And I'm always working with that person on the other line, talking to them having an open dialogue and discussion to say, listen, does this make sense? Maybe we can come up with something together. You know, you've got to take the approach, step back and listen to what people say as what Grace said in terms of um, listening to what they have to say and then navigating through that for yourself. Um, but battles are different. You, you have to pick and choose which ones you really want to go forward with. And I would agree with Grace that the one on pay definitely is a hot topic that comes up constantly, especially for us as women. And, you know, I will never forget when I was at a company, I'm going to remain nameless. <laughs> and when I was working in HR, um, this particular incident, I was in charge of making sure to process the, um, the offer letter and things of that nature. I will never forget this. Two people, same role, woman, man, and he got twice as much as what she received. And I'm sitting there like, they're doing the same job. How is that? So, you know, you got to kind of step back and say, well, you know, 
we are looking at an experience. We're looking at all that. Right. But it's the same role. Some of that does come into play. So, you know, those are the things that you're going to battle and have challenges with. And you got to learn when to speak up and say, listen. And in that moment, I did. I said, listen, if we're going to extend an offer, we need to take a look at this and see to make sure we're doing this um, not only competitively, but fairly across the board. How does that look? You know, I'm processing this. I'm looking right at it. So do I stay quiet or do I speak up? And there's many a times where I've come across situations like that. Mm -mm. Go back, take a look at your pay grade, find a little more money. <laughs> you know what I mean? So there's times where you as a person in a leadership role need to do that. And, um, you know, and sometimes you win those battles and sometimes you don't. But those are things that we as the women on this panel have probably had to come across in some way, shape or form um, to, to make sure that things are being done equitably across the board. And it's still a, you know, a gap. There was what, a dollar for a man over every woman's 80 cents to that, you know, women of color, particularly lower than that. So we've got to really, as was said earlier, speak up about it, get on the um, committees that are at your company, you know, research the companies that you're actually applying into, see what they do offer, you know? So you gotta do your homework um, behind it. So that way you can advocate and invest in yourself. Hey, I Leslie, can I just yeah. add something to what Jennifer said there is, you know, and, and what everybody kind of said. Also, you know, we understand that not everybody's in a position of leadership or authority where they, they can fight that battle. That's okay. Um, and even as leaders, sometimes you, you are just not in a position to have to fight. That doesn't mean that you back off of the cause. It just means you take a different route. Sometimes you win the, the war that I talked about by kind of working behind the scenes and bringing people along and educating them and, you know, building more advocates on, on your behalf of whatever the cause is. And sometimes you, you have to know the battle won is maybe walking away. So that, I just wanted to add that last piece. Yeah, I think that those are, that, that's such a great way to think about it. Um, and and a, a great, uh, Jennifer, a great example of, of when to do that. I think the more we talk about this, the more, the more impact we have. And the more we talk about it to people that we know will, are likely to be on our team about it. And even people that are maybe not as uh, aware of that. Uh, my husband works in tech and I'm constantly like, how much does she make? And can you affect that? <laughs> he wishes I would stay, I would buy my own business. Um, so, okay, well, thank you so much panelists. Now, uh, attendees, we have a couple minutes for questions. So go ahead and unmute yourself and ask a question or type it in the chat and we'll relay it. Um, please name somebody that you would uh, particularly like to answer your question. Okay, well, you guys are all thinking hard. I just want to give you a, a quick plug to make sure that you're looking in the uh, chat for the link to the survey uh, so you can have submission into our uh, raffle drawing. Uh, I know we covered a lot of ground. Um, so maybe you had your questions uh, answered already. Does anyone have anything that comes to mind for our panelists? I have a question. Are you guys able to hear me? Yes. Oh, hi. Um, and I guess I'll ask for, uh, I love you. Everybody was great. I'll just say that first. Um, generally to the panel, it could be really quick. Um, if there's anything, one thing you might regret in terms of, and it, I know it's hard. I'm a person of no regrets. I do believe everything happens for a reason, but if there was anything you could have done differently in your journey, what might it be or done better? What might it be? anybody that's a tough one because never but that's a great question you know but the reason why it's tough is because even the things that I did badly or not as well as I thought taught me something 
So, you know, even if I look back on the incident I mentioned earlier, it was like, you know, well, maybe I should have just stood up for myself and told her, no, that's your problem if you can't deal with me. Um, but in, instead of going through that journey, but you know, even from that, I learned something and I learned strategy and communications. I learned, you know, how to, to, to kind of position myself. So, so that's a hard one for me. I don't know if anybody else on the panel, but I'm trying to think of, of what I actually might regret. Serena, what are you about to say? You look like you got something. No, no I was going to say, I mean, a uh, quote I live by, it's a Nelson Mandela quote and it's, I never lose. I either win or I learn. That's right. And, and that is really it. And it's a hard question to answer in hindsight because we're looking back yep. and we're recalling the lessons. And we realize that failures are only perceived failures at the moment. But when I look back and I started asking myself questions like, what did I learn about myself? One, for me is what did I learn about my God? That's my second question. Uh -huh. The third one is what did I, you know what I mean? How does this move me forward? Right. And so for every time I felt like I failed and there were plenty. There were times when I lost plenty of money. I've made millions. I've made nothing. I've made million again. I made nothing. I made six figures. I made 30,000. You know, like we've had, <laughs> I've been on a roller coaster, uh, but I'm built for this. Right. right. I'm built for this. And it's all um, developing, like, um, like Grace has said earlier, the, those transferable skills <laughs> are, I got it. I got a truckload. What, what you need to do? That's right. we, there's, there is not you. I'm unstoppable. Right? The way these transferable skills are set up, that's I'm right. just learning and learning. <laughs> you know, so that that that's me personally. I agree. But and, and you know yeah. the other thing that I would add is to not be afraid. And I think that's you know Serena's touching on it. Don't be afraid to fail. Don't you know or whatever you may think failure is. Don't be afraid to make the mistakes or take the bad step or take the bad job, because you can course correct or like Serena said, learn from it, gain from it, and then build upon it. So that's the the, the interesting thing about that question is, we don't want any of us. We don't want any of you to feel afraid to make the decision that might be the wrong one, because that's also where you can get stuck, and you can get stuck with not moving forward. As you should. I just want to add to that and just to give context to the question. For me, I think I get so comfortable with the pivot <laughs> that I move so much. I'm very comfortable with failure, you know, so I've switched, I've moved careers, I've changed and it's like, you know, just maybe constantly and I'm thinking about making another one now and it's like, okay, should you sit down <laughs> and just reevaluate what you've learned here? So I was just interested to see, but I, I, I get everything is resonating in terms of you know, yeah, you, you're resilient. You're going to get up and bounce back. But is there anything you would do differently? And I struggle with that saying, no, because if I did it differently, I wouldn't be where I am. I wouldn't have learned the lesson. So yeah, I get it. Right. It's just great to hear that being reinforced by you guys anyway, <laughs> that I'm not crazy. It's all right. <laughs> it's a, there's another thing that I'll throw out too is, you know, I think sometimes, um, you know, we aspire to get into roles or to take on new opportunities or run businesses, you know, what, whatever it is and think, okay, I'm good. Once I accomplish that, I'm good. No, you, you have to keep evolving. You have to keep striving, get comfortable with being uncomfortable, put yep. yourself in those positions that, they're uncomfortable because you're learning, you're, you're in a new environment, um, you know, not, not in a negative way, I mean uncomfortable, but I mean like you're constantly pushing yourself. You've got that grind, that, that, um, that passion to, to learn, to be a continuous uh, learner. And um, Leslie, you mentioned your husband's in the tech field. One of the things you hear all the time in that field is fail fast and learn from it. Pick yourself up and, and roll, you know, the best learning sometimes are from mistakes that you've made. I know they have been for me. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you guys, I appreciate it. It's a great question. It is. So we have a question um, from, I see uh, Ariana, you've got your hand up, go ahead. Hi. Um, I just want to thank everyone. I, you know, I think that part of what drew me to Pierce and part of what, you know, drew me to this panel is just that, sorry, my lighting is terrible in here. Um, but part of what drew me to this panel was just that I, I've suffered from work trauma and I haven't really worked like regular since. And I've actually, Serena, like hearing that you're an entrepreneur and I, I'm a sign language interpreter. So I'm just 
I freelance, um, that hustle is real and you really have to you learn so much about yourself when you're up against the ropes. And I feel like that's kind of what all of you echoed. So I don't really have a question. I just have more of a gratitude, you know, like this is, it's nice to be in a room with like-minded people and, and understand that like, regardless of what you're going through, um, you can bounce back, but also to the HR folks, you know, like what is out there for people that are like me? Like how is, I was let go for like no real, no real reason. And they said it, they were like Pennsylvania, whatever law, we don't have to tell you, you know, and then they gave me a made up reason. And then you find out later that it was just because like we're restructuring and then that's fine. But like, what is out there for people that are like me? What is the, what is the protocol for something like that? Because it, it comes and it goes like you can, you can lose everything in a day. You can, you can have a to-do list one day and nothing the next day. So what is that net like? And like, how are we in the future for future generations impact? Like, how are we creating a safety net for them? Because for me, I know that like, there's nothing, there was no, there was no guidebook to being like, go, you know, like, but I feel like there isn't, there is an opportunity to create and, and to work with that person, even if it's, even if it's like, hey, you know, I understand this is a lot of information for you. Here's something that might help you going forward, because I think that there is nothing, there's nothing to help that person in the long run. Well, Ariana, I can take that from an HR perspective for you. You know, um, you can, if you're saying you're doing all, like I can tell you from my, from my company view, we would, we would love to take you. We, it doesn't matter in terms of if you come interview, you have that kind of drive and in, in your belly and you're willing to learn something different and new. Um, you know, we're, I'm open for that. So that's what attracts me to the candidate that comes in. You know, you can have a laundry list of, I've been this, I've done this, I've done this, but I'm looking for that authentic person who I know is going to stay, who I know is going to um, work hard for the company, not just for the company, but for themselves. So you can clearly feel that in your testimony, right? In terms of what you'd like to do. I, yeah. I freelanced over here. I mean, I know the other day we just hired a guy who was a baker and he's now in a store and he's learning banking. So, you know, again, it does go back to transferable skills. It doesn't mean because you didn't work in this that you're not able to do it. 70% of a job is um, you can easily pick up one. The rest of it falls in if you're willing to learn, if you're willing to train, you know, I think Grace said it um, best earlier too, the transferable skills piece of it, if you know how to sell, if you know how to do this, you have to also identify what you want to do. You don't want to get into a job that, you know, you're going to be unhappy with either, if you know, in the long term. But if it's something that you're saying, listen, um, I, you know, I'm being transparent, I'm being open, I want to try this out. I think this can work for you and I, you know, th that's I what we of kind of, I look for. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Grace. No, that wasn't me. Oh, okay. Um, I thought, I think, I think mostly like my experience was an experience. Um, and I think, but the thing that I, the, the thing that I did right, I think was just being open and honest. Like you said, this happened to me. It was not my fault. Like they said, it was not mm -hmm. my fault. And we were honest about that. I think my question is mostly like, what, what kind of protocol in HR is, is there is there something is there a net for a person because I feel like that's what that's what I was lacking is there that net for a person that says it's okay that this happened to you like and Dawn I think you talked about it too when things were you know you were doing one thing one way and then the next day you weren't is there like a net for a person to sort of fall into is there something is there a resource out there um, for the confusion that you may feel Well, for one, you can't let the experience of being let go define who you are, right? right? You know, not everyone works out at every company for one reason or another. I mean, my situation was a little bit different. I wasn't being asked to leave the company. I was being asked to redo, rethink everything the way I've known it for a couple of decades. Um, 
I did have moments where I thought perhaps I will be let go. What am I going to do? Am I going to curl up and die? No, I'm not going to let that experience define me. I have skills. I'm a good person. I know HR, you know, um, and it, you know, it's hard when you're in that moment to talk yourself through that. So when you say, is there a, a net? I, I, don't, I don't know if I'm really can, understanding can I, the question. Can I give the unpopular answer? Yes. Girl, no, there is no net. Thank you. If you That's work all. for somebody, they let you go <laughs> if they want to, and they follow the law, but they, you got to go. Okay, so- can Yeah, I no, I, I, listen, this was a couple of years ago. I just, I saw an opportunity yeah. to ask a question. <laughs> And I'm, I'm good now, but I just, here's like, what I would say. And I mean, of course, you know, of course my perspective is entrepreneurship, right? But um, entrepreneurship is a real thing too, right? So wherever you're working, um, it is, it is under, it, you should be going into any opportunity um, with how do I add value? How do I solve problems? How do I make myself irresistible? How do I make myself like, you, you would be doing yourself a disservice to get rid of me. Get, you understand when I provide value on top of value. What I would say is every single person on the call, when you talk about, um, you know, there's no handbook for being let go. You're right. There's not. But what you can do and what those of you that are students and you're looking and you're trying to figure out what you want to do, what you ought to do is certainly develop the ability to see opportunity where others see obstacles. That's internal. You, you have right. to develop um, remarkable skills, be memorable. You, you understand what I mean? You have to put yourself in a position to learn everywhere so that your transferable skill bucket is so awesome that it doesn't matter where you go. And so you're right. not, you know, because we're, we're living in a different time. Yeah. We're just living in a different time, period. Yeah, no, I, I was just curious and I appreciate the, the honesty and, and no, yeah, I girl. Mean, for me, no. for me, back, back then, I mean, I de definitely was on my couch for three days and cried. And like, that's, that's a vibe, that's a vibe. It happened. But if you saw me now, like cut, cut to this fall, like yeah. you, it is, I think entrepreneurship and I'm almost like not wanting to go backwards, you know, like almost just want to keep going with entrepreneurship. So hearing mm -hmm. the words, those words, and just understanding that there is, there's life after that and knowing that. And I think that that's definitely been my guide post so any fast talker real person it's 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 a it's a thing that needs to be thanks Ariana Marcy Thank we've got uh we've got a uh one question from the chat and then um Believe it or not, we are we are over time here. So um, thank you so much, uh, Marcy. If you could pose that, if anyone's got to jump off, I understand. Um, again, thank you so much, and make sure you do that survey. Sure. Our question in the chat is: um, This person is a shy speaker and less challenged. Um, she tends to stutter and forget what she wants to say. But as soon as someone has challenged her intelligence, she becomes confident, and people are wowed by her. So she wants to know. How can she have that confidence all the time without being in a defensive mode? Right. I'll, I'll start that one. Um, I would say, you know, you know, how do you build your confidence? You prepare, 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 you know, write things down. Um, there are all kinds of resources out there, either with Pierce or, you know, LinkedIn. There are all types of apps out there that you can practice with. If you've got, you know, a confidant or a peer or somebody that you can kind of test some things out, how does this sound? Here's what I'm thinking. What do you, you know, what do you think? Get their, get their feedback. Um, but the more you prepare, the more knowledgeable you are about whatever it is that you're speaking of, um, that brings the confidence. And, you know, sometimes I think we are in positions where we think we have to speak really fast. We have to get our points across fast because somebody's going to talk over us or they're going to move on. No, set the tone. You know, if you need to slow it down and, and speak slowly so that, you know, you are covering all your thoughts, that's okay. Um, have a cheat sheet in front of you. Maybe you, you, you know, bulleted your, your notes that, or the points that you want to make. Um, but, you know, prepare. That's probably the biggest thing that I could say that, if you're prepared and you've done the work and you know what you want to say, um, that brings the confidence. And I would, I would add, I totally agree with everything that Grace said. And the only thing that I would add is, you know, Brittany, when I read this, it really touched my heart, you know, because 
you know, I, I could really feel what you were saying and where you are in those moments and probably those feelings of, you know, panic when the, the spotlight's on you, what do you say? And then having to deal with the emotion of someone challenging you and making you feel less. So I, one of the things that I wanted to say to you is this, the, don't let these other folks um, dictate your worth, dictate your voice. When I, when I read this, I could see that you do have, you know your stuff. You should be confident in that. You have the confidence in that. When they challenge you, you come right with it. You are able to wow people. So that says that you already got this. You already know this. You don't need someone else to justify that or make you feel it. You got it. And you have to be comfortable in that. You have to know and accept that. And so then the other piece that I would kind of piggyback on what Grace is saying is, because we don't, you know, there are the times you're going to have time to prepare and sometimes when you don't. Those times when you don't, what Grace said is an excellent point. Have total faith and confidence in yourself and your knowledge. So if you need to set the tone for the conversation, if you don't have a lot to say, if you just need to make your quick point, get in and get out, then be okay with that and feel comfortable with yourself. Again, we've been talking through this whole, this whole meeting tonight about your authentic self. Right. Your authentic self doesn't mean that you have to communicate the way that other people do. And so in terms of what you're measuring yourself against and, you know, um, stuttering and forgetting what you have to say, that's because in your mind, you're trying to be something else. You're trying to, to be what you believe someone else needs you to be. No, be you. Be Brittany. Communicate. Find your style of mode of communication. Do that. And that will, you'll see that it, it will become a little bit more consistent. It'll become a little bit more flat in terms of how you're responding and how you're giving feedback. But believe in yourself consistently. Be yourself. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much to everybody. I know there's a couple questions that came in. Um, but we are we're over time, and I wanted to respect everyone's time tonight. Um, I thank you from the bottom of my heart, panelists. This has been so inspiring. I had like notes written about this, but I am overflowing <laughs> with uh, positivity and like go get it. I want to handle it. I've got some some affirmations I'm going to say to myself every morning. I'm someone who, you know, I'm built for this roller coaster. <laughs> so um, thank you so much to everybody. Uh, we will be in touch. We'll, we'll do the, uh, the drawing for the book on Friday um, and the raffle on Friday. So thank you so much. Um, I appreciate everyone's time. I hope everyone has a great rest of the day. And we hope to see you at our events too. We have two tomorrow um, about... Uh, growing Your Natural Resilience with Dr. Kathy Littlefield and The Growth Mindset and Neuroplasticity with Dr. Stephanie Donovan. And on Friday, we have our Career Reinvention Panel um, and that'll be our closing. And I hope to see you all there. You're all invited. If you didn't get a link, email me, I'll send it. I got you, check out Serena's website. Uh, I'm excited to read that book. Um, all right, much love to everybody. Have a wonderful rest of your night. Thank you. Right. Thank you for having us.